Thank you everybody for joining today. Um, this is the Asthma Quality Improvement um, Action Period Call number five. I appreciate you all for joining and I can't believe we have uh, made it almost halfway through the program. I appreciate all of you and your hard work throughout this process, including uh, joining today's call. We wanna thank our program partner, uh, ODH Bureau of Child and Family Health Asthma Program. And this is ODH's disclaimer about today's presentations. And a little plug for what Ohio AAP has going on. So coming up on Friday, April 19th is our uh, spring education meeting. Uh, we um, It takes place in Dublin, Ohio. You're all welcome to join. Um, the uh, address here is ohioaap.org slash spring meeting, or I can send you additional information. Um, this one is always a good one. Um, there's always good conversation, good collaboration like we will have today. Um, and your topics include um, ADHD, um, lead prevention, uh, working with families. Uh, it's free to you and you get lunch. So if you want more information, uh, you can go online or talk to me. And then speaking of uh, lead prevention, we also have published a lead poisoning prevention board book. These are available to you free of charge. Um, the website for that is ohioaap.org slash leadbooks. Uh, the book is, is a nice one. It, it was a, a team effort for this, and it's called Thanks for Keeping Me Lead Free. You can also reach out to me for more information. Okay, so again, welcome everybody. Uh, we will hear about uh, your uh, aggregate data review. Dr. Hardy will share with us an asthma pearl, and then we will get started with the Best Practices Learning Collaborative. Okay, if you haven't done so already, uh, welcome, and please in the chat share your name and your practice. And Zainab, ready when you are. Great, thanks, Brooke. I, I wanted to start by thanking everybody uh, for submitting their data on time. Um, you know, that's really imperative to have everyone get their data and see their progress throughout um, throughout the project. So we really hope to get all the data that you know that you have available in time and in our system, so that when we analyze it, we're looking at everybody's data in terms of the aggregate. We understand that some practices may have some trouble getting that data in um, the first week of the month. Uh, so we want to let you know that we, we are flexible if, if, you know, if you do need that. But please let us know if you are submitting data after the deadline, just so that we're aware of it. Um, sometimes when we look at data for the next month, uh, we realize that there were some additional entries for the previous month. Uh, so yeah, if you are submitting any data after the deadline, please let us know, please you know, send a Brooke an email or just let us know in any way um, so that we are incorporating all of that data into the aggregate charts that you're gonna see now. Um, but again, thank you so much for being on top of things for the practices that are. That are. Um, we really appreciate your time and you know the effort that you're putting in um, to getting your data in accurately. Uh, Brooke, I'm ready for, your, for the first slide. Um, so, um, as you know, uh, we're collecting uh, measures or we're collecting different data points for a lot of different things here um, in the asthma program, but specifically for optimal asthma care. Really what we want to know is if they have an asthma action plan in, in place um, and if they have two of any of the other things that we're collecting. So if you're collecting severity of their asthma, if you're um, looking at their environmental triggers, um, if you are giving them any handouts that you have in the office or any handouts that we've provided, um, so it can be a combination of any, of any of those two along with an asthma action plan. Um, we are seeing very significant increases since the beginning of baseline and I mean, since the beginning of QI in December, um, but we're also seeing significant increases from month to month. Um, so the data um, looks very positive. Uh, we want to keep this trend line going up um, closer, you know, closer to the 90s range, the high 90s. Um, and we're very hopeful um, to get to 100. We understand that that could be a little bit difficult, but, uh, but you know, with the performance that we've seen with you guys, uh, we don't think that's too far off. Um, next slide, please. Um, and then here, asthma symptom control. Um, so this is just um, assessing their, their symptoms and seeing the severity of their symptoms. Again, we are seeing significant increases from December, um, from December to January and from January to February. Both of those uh, months, we're seeing significant increases. Um, again, um, that, you know, you guys should give yourself credit for, you know, increasing your, um, you know, increasing that data and making that data look better. Again, we're trying to get that number closer to 100, um, but overall the practices are still doing great. Next slide, please. 
Um, and this one is just really the same um, measure as the previous slide, but just looking at diverse patients. Again, uh, we know that one practice specifically does not ask about uh, race. Uh, so we're keeping that in mind, but um, diverse patients can also uh, look at socioeconomic status, um, which we are measuring by their uh, insurance or you know their insurance provider. Here, uh, we really want to maintain it at about 10%. Um, we want at least 10% of the patients that you're seeing uh, be or the patients that you're screening be um, patients of diverse background. Um, so even if we see this uh, line fluctuate a little bit, that is okay. Um, but we still want to see at least a significant number of your diverse patients being screened. Um, so just keep that in mind when you're looking at the slide, even if it looks a little up and down, that that is not a sign of you not doing well. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and this is asthma uh, symptom severity again. Um, we're looking at the severity uh, of their symptoms. Um, in the individual slot, in your individual practice slides, you won't see this um, this measure. Uh, specifically um, for the aggregate slides, ODH asks for some additional measures. Um, so this is included in that, just to know overall how the practices are doing. But as you can see, um, that rate is very high. So um, individually are also doing very well. If you are interested in this specific measure for your practice, um, you can let us know and we can provide that to you. But as of right now, these, this specific uh, measure is not included in your individual practice uh, slides. Next slide, please. Um, and again, this is going back to, to the asthma action plan. Um, again, I know we've mentioned this before, but it could be an asthma action plan that they've already had in place that you are reviewing or updating, or they couldn't. They could be not having any asthma action plan, um, and then you start one with them. Um, so yeah, it could be any of those three options. Um, again, um, I know that we've mentioned this before, but just as a reminder. And again, we are seeing, again here, increases from uh, baseline all the way throughout February with gradual increases every month. Next slide, please. Um, and this is uh, triggers and environmental, asthma triggers and environmental factors, um, whether or not you're screening for that. Again, we are seeing some increases uh, we didn't really see a much of a, of a change from uh, December to January, but from January to February, we are seeing a significant increase there. Next slide, please. Um, and this self-management materials, I know um, if you've looked at your slides previously and if you look at them now, this, this may look a little bit different. Uh, we decided to include an asthma action plan within self-management materials. So if there's an asthma action plan in place, technically that person did receive self-management materials um, or it could be, um, or if they don't have an asthma action plan in place, but they did receive handouts, then those individuals are also included in this number. Um, so we did see an, a significant increase from baseline um, in December and we are seeing gradual increases um, throughout February. And again, we're, really trying to get this number as high as we can. Uh, and again, like I said, uh, it could be an asthma action plan or any handouts that you have in your practice or any handouts that we've provided to you uh, for your patients. Next slide, please. Uh, patients with uh, persistent asthma that are on controller medications, this number has been consistently high, even in baseline, um, which isn't very surprising. Uh, but we did see a little bit of a dip um, in February um, but it's, it's still, it's still in the higher range. We, we hope to get that back to where it was at least, or even higher. Um, but overall, like I said, the practices are still doing excellent. Next slide, please. Um, and then flu vaccine. So we also want to know what percentage of your patient population that you're seeing, um, has the current flu vaccine. We are seeing some dips, um, from, baseline throughout February, as you see here in the slide. Um, we've seen that some uh, uh, some practices have some comments in there um, about vaccine hesitancy or, you know, if the, if the, if the parent refuses um, the vaccine for their child. So we are keeping that in mind. But um, this, this information is just for you to know um, some general information about the patients in your practice. 
um, and any, you know, flu symptoms that could exacerbate their, uh, their asthma symptoms. So this is also something for you to keep in mind, just for you, something for you to mention to your uh, patient families, you know, just to, I guess, improve their quality of life and improve their, um, kind of decrease their symptoms or the severity of their symptoms. Next slide, please. Um, and from this slide, moving forward, we are really interested in um, having the uh, trend line decrease. Um, so we uh, are doing pretty great um, um, in terms of emergency department visits or urgent care visits. We are seeing lower numbers, in, uh, lower than 10%. Uh, we're trying to get that as close to zero as we can. Um, and these, again, are urgent care visits or emergency department visits due to asthma. Um, we are seeing, like I said, we are seeing a dip, um, which we do want to see. Uh, so again, uh, we're doing great there. And the next slide looks at hospitalizations. Um, that's closer to zero, which um, is excellent. Again, again, like I mentioned, we are looking to see uh, a, a, trend, a downward trend line, uh, which we are seeing. And here in the next uh, in the next slide, we're looking at referrals. So anyone that's referred to an asthma specialist, again, uh, we are seeing comments um, from uh, physicians that are saying that you know the patient family is requesting to have an asthma um, specialist or have someone look at their child that is more specialized in terms of asthma. Um, so that's something that we're keeping in mind. But again, we are seeing pretty low pretty low rates here as well. Um, as I mentioned, overall, the practices are doing great. Um, keep up the good work. If anyone has questions, please uh, put them in the chat or um, unmute yourself. And if not, if questions come up later, um, please let us know. Or if you have any questions about your uh, practice-specific data, um, that's, those are questions that we could definitely answer as well. Zainab, thank you so much. Um, yeah, your individual data will be sent to you in this Friday's email. Any questions for Zainab on the aggregate? Okay, hearing none, seeing none, Zainab, thanks so much for your time. Thank you. Okay, Dr. Hardy, I have your slides. Okay, so uh, Eva, Angela, Eva, Angela and I decided we, we try something a little different um, this, this call and just have a little clinical pearl at the beginning. Um, see if you like it. You know, we just thought we'd try it one time and then kind of go and see, see if people found it useful or not. Just spend about five minutes talking about something. So um, I'm doing the first one and I decided to talk about cough. And when I talked to you all about preschool asthma, I had a little section there about, you know, the old adage, not all that wheezes is asthma. Um, and you kind of can have that also um, apply that to cough. Not all that coughs is asthma as well. And so when I'm, um, you know, chronic cough is not an uncommon referral in a general pulmonary clinic. So when I'm with the pulmonary fellows, um, sometimes I sort of like to ask them questions and I've come up with sort of my top 10 reasons for a chronic cough. So I thought we'd talk about that just for, again, for just a couple minutes go over my top 10 reasons for chronic cough. So if you wanna go ahead and advance the slides, Brooke. So first, the definition. Um, the chronic cough definition is a little bit different in pediatrics than in adults. In adults, they have three different types of cough, uh, three definitions. There's acute, subacute, and chronic. And a chronic cough in adults is eight weeks. But in the pediatric literature, and this is actually based on data, um, they feel like a chronic cough should be really uh, four weeks or longer. Um, and so, you know, my top 10 list, by the way, it's, I just made this up. So first of all, you're not going to find this anywhere um, in a publication, but I have read a lot. There is actually a fair amount of chronic cough literature in pediatrics, which I've, uh, I've read in the past. So it's kind of derived from that. But we're calling, again, a chronic cough of lasting at least four weeks. That's been persistent. Okay, so I have it broken down to three, four main categories. 
And this top 10, this is not in order of most likelihood. Instead, it's just sort of broken down by the different categories. First category is infectious. And the first you see there is an acute non-resolving either a chronic airway or a parenchymal infection. So this would be, for instance, a chronic pneumonia. Or if we were in a developing nation, you'd be worried of obviously about tuberculosis, for instance. You'd want to get a chest X-ray. But another thing that a lot of time gets overlooked, and one of the more common causes of chronic cough in pediatrics, especially if it's a wet cough, is something called protracted bacterial bronchitis, which, as the name implies, is just a bacterial infection in the airways that, that has gone on for weeks and weeks and weeks. The second category is recurrent resolving respiratory infection. I think this is probably the most common cause, especially this time of year. And this is a child gets an infection and it lasts for a period of time. And just when they're recovering, they get a second infection and so forth and so on. And I'll show a little bit of data about that after this slide. And then my third is post-infectious. And, and this could be easily overlooked, but there's a pretty well known phenomena of post-infectious cough, the classic being that with pertussis. Pertussis is sometimes called the 100-day cough because it's known that children cough and cough and cough for afterwards for long periods of time, not because the infection persists, but because of the immunologic or the uh, toxin damage to the uh, airway. And it's not just pertussis that can give a post-infectious cough that goes on for a period of time. RSV is well known, especially in the adult world, to be a cause of chronic cough. And data in uh, mycoplasma pneumonia infections suggests that the average cough goes about 38 to 39 days. Um, for pertussis, by the way, the average was actually 118 days. So, you know, post-infectious cough could be, you know, certainly something to think about. Next slide. So this is data that, you know, I'm sure those, especially those of you in, in the community in primary care practice know very well. This is looking at all the studies, a bunch of studies that looked at how long children have symptoms after they have a viral infection. And it could be any symptom, but cough was one of the big ones there. And if you look at the solid black line, which is sort of the third line down, that's the mean average of these, what, five different studies. And if you look at about the 50th percent point, it's about 10 days. But one thing to point out is that if you go out, you know, if everything's a bell-shaped curve, right? And if you go out to the, sort of the far extreme of the bell-shaped curve, you don't even have to go that far out where you get, oh, I don't know, maybe 25% of patients are still having symptoms at two weeks. And, you know, still maybe 15% have symptoms at around three weeks. So again, it's, as we all know, children get about six to six to seven illnesses a year. If you're in a daycare setting, probably more than that. And they tend to be compressed between the fall and early spring. So it's not hard to see a scenario where a child gets an infection and then he gets another one. And some of those might have, again, might have these spread out bell-shaped curves where they're having symptoms for two or three weeks, even four weeks at a time. And it just feels like it's one prolonged cough. Okay. Next group I call my non-infectious airway inflammation. So asthma, we all know that asthma causes cough. There's something called the upper airway cough syndrome. And this is usually um, a like post, uh, a, a post airway drip from say allergy, allergic post nasal drip or from sinuses. It's not in the pediatric cough literature. It's not considered very high. It's more, you see, see it more in chronic cough in the adult world than in the pediatric world. It's probably, if it is causing a cough, it's going to be quite a bit different from a asthma cough or an infectious cough. It's going to be more upper airway type of a cough. And then I always put foreign body in there. It's probably pretty unusual, but I like to have that in my differential just because that's one thing I don't want to miss. Um, so that's, you know, another reason why I might get a, you know, I, I almost always get a chest x-ray in a patient with a chronic cough because I want to rule out any, again, non-resolving parenchymal infection, any suggestion of a foreign body, um, or any other parenchymal abnormality. Okay, next, I call this extra pulmonary. And so aspiration, and I especially think that this is not, this is relatively common in your younger children. So if they have any kind of a discoordinated swallowing reflex, or the swallowing reflex hasn't been developed yet, you know, that's certainly on the list. Gastroesophageal reflux would be really low on my list. And again, the pediatric literature 
differs than the adult literature of chronic cough and saying that this is not that common, whereas in the adult world, it's considered a little bit more common. So much less likely to do an empiric trial of H2 blockers, for instance, um, um, you know, for reflux, just because I'm not terribly convinced from one, at least from my reading and from my personal experience that reflux and otherwise healthy children is a big cause of chronic cough, but it's on the list. And then habit cough, you know, that probably peaks at around nine to 10 years of age. Usually you can tell by the description or often the children will have that special cough, that very barky honky cough in the uh, when they're you know, you've seen them in clinic next and then this is a this is just a, i put this slide up here as a little reminder about aspiration why we think about aspiration maybe a little bit more in the you know as a peds pulmonologist i think of aspiration as having two main potential causes for children one could be as i mentioned earlier just a delayed swallowing reflex or their coordination hasn't matured yet but then another thing that can cause an aspiration cough with feeding is if there's an actual anatomic abnormality. So this is showing on the far left, a, a normal airway. The second would be like a more of a deep arytenoid notch and then with type one laryngeal esophageal cleft. And so, you know, you could have a chronic cough, as I mentioned, because you have an abnormality in your swallowing reflex. You could have a chronic cough because you have a clear anatomic um, abnormality. And sometimes it's a little bit in between. You know, not all type 1 clefts are a problem. They can often be seen as a, a normal variant. But if you, you know, if you combine maybe the swallowing reflex isn't mature and there's a little bit of a type 1 cleft there, then that could be a combination. That combination could lead to a chronic cough. And then finally, last is just chronic parenchymal disorder. You know, that could be, that's sort of an other category. So that'd be some much more rare things, but Things like uh, primary ciliary dyskinesia. Um, you know, sometimes bronchiectasis is, is something that we're always worried about. That may be hard to see in a chest X-ray. So sometimes we'll get a CAT scan just to look for uh, any more subtle abnormalities that might be causing this type of chronic cough. Okay, that's all I got. Dr. Hardy, thank you. Any questions on cough? Yeah, tick cough. I totally agree. See that too. Um, yeah, it's it's a it's kind of hard to rule that out, right? Habit cough and tick cough. I mean, I usually know it. I feel that way, but sometimes it takes a little bit of work for me to convince families that that's a issue. But yeah, that you know, right around I don't know for whatever reason, nine, ten, eleven seems to be kind of the peak age where something called the pediatric size syndrome, um, habit cough, tick cough seem to develop. Oh, very interesting. Dr. Hardy, thanks so much. Okay. Um, the time has come where we want to kick off uh, now that we are primed with um, some knowledge of our data, how we're doing, and uh, more knowledge of cough, the Best Practices Learning Collaborative. Uh, hopefully, we can have a good conversation, including everyone who was able to join the call today. Uh, Zainab and I have the privilege and pleasure of talking to all of you, uh, kind of getting the program started and talking to you at the practice coaching calls and kind of the back and forth questions, but you don't get the pleasure of talking to each other and there's limited communication directly with the uh, asthma team. So want to um, kind of uh, give you some talking points to hopefully you can share more on. Um, please know that I pulled these talking points from the surveys you have been submitting and from the conversations we've been having. Uh, they are de-identified. Um, I don't feel too comfortable calling on you, but um, we have uh, talked about these uh, on our calls and I may have um, asked you to maybe share more uh, if you feel comfortable today. So with that, um, I was playing around with kind of the, the design feature of, um, of the slides here. So um, one of the things that came up early and often, thank you, Dr. Cardenas, 
um, was um, the good tech advances you've made um, in terms of the asthma program. Some of you have um, built out um, asthma templates and dot phrases that you were already using. Uh, but some of you had to kind of incorporate uh, these pieces into your EMR for the program going forward, and we appreciate that. So one of the first things that we talked about in uh, the first round of action period or uh, practice coaching calls was um, adding tech um, in terms of um, the asthma questions and kind of what we're asking in the screening tool into your systems to make it a better workflow. So some of the examples that you have shared um, tech advances around your practice kind of globally, I will go across and then uh, EMR, that should be EHR templates, uh, dot phrases, new tools and processes, um, kind of an umbrella, but you are working on that. Uh, order sets for asthma include the ACT, the asthma action plan and inhaler use education, which is a good thing, make it more easily accessible. Um, additions to chart templates, uh, chart templates for asthma visits, well visits, and sick visits for patients with asthma. Um, I think it's good to incorporate all of those things and all of those visit types um, so you can know to ask those questions uh, of your patients with asthma. Uh, continuing on with uh, the dot phrases technology, uh, helping with the documentation, and a reminder, this will come up a lot in kind of the trends of what you have been talking about. So um, because something is new and, and the implementation and the workflow is new, you may need a reminder to um, get that in your flow. Uh, so around asthma action plan and um, the ACT. And then using EHR and EMR to track uh, ED and urgent care visits uh, and follow up. Um, this is reflected in the data that this is happening. Um, kind of across the board with the screening tool uh, pieces, and then embedding the asthma action plan into the EHR or EMR, a good idea. And then added um, the asthma meds and dosing to favorites. Um, that might be a drop down if you have Epic or uh, whatever program you're using. I think that's a good practice. And then uh, someone shared uh, today, so I can share their behalf. Uh, we encourage families to use the asthma action plan in patients in my chart. Uh, since this is something they can access on their smartphone and from anywhere, and they don't have to carry a piece of paper with them. So some families uh, want the piece of paper. They can have different copies in, in different homes or school. Uh, but if uh, there's something that they can access maybe more quickly um, on the phone, uh, that is maybe also useful. So uh, I will stop here. Anyone want to um, share with what they're doing around asthma and tech uh, and kind of build on the pieces here? Hi, it's Justin Rich. Can you hear me? Yeah, thanks. Okay. Um, so I, uh, I, so we're on the EPIC uh, program. I don't know how many people here are, but it's a pretty robust system. Lots of nooks and crannies to investigate, and I'm nowhere near getting all of the functionality down. But I made a template, uh, which in retrospect was relatively ambitious, um, pretty big and uh, after you know about a month or so I realized that people most people aren't coming in to talk about asthma they're coming in on their checkups and doing this big template I had was very very cumbersome so I had to switch it around to a much smaller one so I could get the just the pearls that I needed and that's what I've been using the last couple of months and it's been much more helpful it's also a dot phrase I just insert it into a different place um, within the within the checkup, but I'm also seeing on here that um, Epic may have and other EMRs may have this too, but like a as an action plan already in the system. I didn't know that. That's amazing. Um, I'll, I, we don't need to go over it now, but I will look for that and maybe hit up the Rainbow people and have to find that thing. Just Sounds like it would be pretty useful. Really quick, we're working on it. It's not done yet. Oh, okay, gotcha. Yeah, honestly, <laughs> actually, like there. There is one. There is one that's done for for the. You can use the basic epic one. It's if not you, for the rainbow one that we built. It's not ready yet. Sorry. But the the one. But there is a basic one in epic that you can just on the on the left hand side of the storyboard under the search feature. You just put type an action plan and it comes up right away, and you can just complete it right there, Justin. Great. Or at, um, and we can send I can send a screenshot of that, and then we can let you know for the rainbow people, but. Anybody else that's on Epic, um, it is built into their basic system. Um, and you could talk to your IT department about where to find it. Thank you. Perfect. 
Yeah, and I would recommend if you have the ability to do it in your system, like that last one, having it so they can have it with them when they're on their phone or, you know, rather than paper because that can get lost or perhaps maybe there's an emergency and they want to make sure a family member who's watching them has it. It can be easily accessible. So encourage you to use it if you can in your system that way. Any other best practices around tech anyone would like to share? Does anybody have like a great, I mean, we've, I think we've shared some of our dot phrases that we collected as a team, but if somebody has, or Justin, like you feel like your template is a dot phrase that you want to share that you think is really helpful to you. I think the more um, we share among each other, um, we just all learn um, what, what something works for some people. So if anybody has something, um, I know that I use a dot phrase for the smart education a lot because I think for families transitioning to that can be, you know, quite a big change for, for some families. So um, again, if you found something that you find educational materials that, that you embed into your notes um, or a template that you use, um, that'd be great to share. And our compiled document um, will be sent out shortly. Okay, uh, so tech is embedded in kind of everything we do around asthma in this program, uh, including prescribing. So uh, because uh, we've all been learning a lot about prescribing uh, practices around asthma during this program, and we heard from Kellen, um, this might be a hot topic, I don't know. Uh, but what are your uh, best approaches to working through prescribing challenges? Um, have you engaged with pharmacy, maybe created more of a relationship than you had before? Um, anything improved with your PA process? Anything else re related to prescribing that you would like to share? Have things around prescribing been going more smoothly now than at the beginning of the program? Angela, why don't you share what you said for your, um, or sorry, Justin, you can go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I, I I don't feel like it's gotten much easier. So if, if you guys can shed some light on that, that'd be helpful. And um, incredibly tough, even for our pulmonary office, because of all the formulary changes in since January, especially with Flovent um, being discontinued by the manufacturer. So right as of now, Ohio Medicaid is covering fluticasone. They generally do prefer brand of most products, but because of the recent change, just so you're aware, so CareSource um, does cover fluticasone. If they've had an old prescription for Flovent, your system may um, still read it as Flovent in the pharmacy. So that might be why you might be getting refills requests. So even though it is covered, they just had, they won't accept until it's listed as the generic. That could potentially change just because they do. Um, I don't, I don't know if they'll switch to some some brand at some point. Um, the problem with some of the commercial insurances, just so you guys are aware, um, this is this is just from my experience in clinic every day. Um, they are many of them are covering Asmonex. Um, be aware, Asmonex has two different types of like medication delivery devices: an HFA, um, which you use with the spacer for most kids, and then a DPI, which is the twist tailor. So when you're ordering, be aware which one you're ordering for the age of the child, but also in addition to that, there has been some difficulties getting Asmonex because now everyone is turning to Asmonex. So there's been some back order with that, which requires basically you, your office to do a prior auth for another inhaler for the for, that we've at least have experienced in Cleveland. Now, I don't know if the other pharmacies like in the other kind of central like Columbus, Cincinnati regions um, are having back orders, but at least in the Cleveland area. Um, and then um, also being aware that many commercial insurances are requesting Pomacourt Flexhaler to be their 
pretty much tier one for the inhalers um, at six um, ages six and up. So that's a dry powdered inhaler, meaning you don't use a spacer with it. You they have to generate the force um, in like a little canister like this by going and taking that medicine and getting it um, into the airway. That can be really difficult for kids six sometimes to eight. I, I think personally, there are some very good seven and eight year olds that can do that technique well with practice. Um, but be aware that most insurances will require you to try that medication and fail. So I've had a lot of people, unfortunately, where I can't get it approved um, to without trying it. So we have to basically give it to them for a few weeks, see how their technique is, see if they can actually do it. And then when they can't, um, we have to do a prior authorization for another M MDI. So just be aware there's a lot of challenges. These are just a few that I encounter on a daily basis. Um, uh, I find it really helpful if you have a pharmacy that you partner with, if you're in an academic institution, they seem to be really helpful and they can help pro the process and let you know if they're back orders. Um, if you're a more private practice, I, I don't know, like if you partner with certain pharmacies or if just getting um, to have um, discussing with staff, how, how prior offs are organized, things like that. If there's any comments that let me know. And not to put you on the spot, did we have um, good information to share around QVAR? Oh, QVAR. So QVAR is only um, brand. So there was a message where someone was saying that they, they most times they try to do it as um, generic, but QVAR is only brand. So in certain insurances will cover that as well. Um, in terms of like tier one or tier two, QVAR is also a dry powdered inhaler. So it's, it's, it looks like it's in um, an MDI canister, but it's not, um, it's not a pump. It's actually breath actuated. So it looks like you hold it up like this and you have to go. And so again, it is oftentimes, I want to say QVAR is on the website for and older, it says, but that technique is really, really, truly difficult for probably anyone who's not incredibly coordinated, maybe seven, six, seven. I, you know, it really just depends on the kid. So um, being aware of what you're prescribing and um, teaching the family, but also understanding if they can't do it, what are the next steps? Like you have to kind of try to get the right canister. Um, Angela, maybe we could send out a list to the people on this call about um, the DPIs versus the um, HFAs and which ages you think might be best. I mean, obviously it's dependent on the insurance, but I think it becomes very confusing if we're all used to using Flovent as our primary yeah. one then to <laughs> switch. So I don't know if that and would be something we could- Unfortunately, um, I would say most kids, I find seven, I don't know, and maybe William, you have different, but seven to eight and up is dry powder and inhaler. If it, you can potentially maybe in someone slightly younger if they're really, really good, but you also have to show them. Like it is not a very intuitive process at all. So um, I usually go and show them a video when they're in the office and then send it to them if they have that option for um, like my chart messages for home so they can review it when they get home because um, it's really hard. <laughs> it's and not that, that intuitive. Have you ever um, tried, you know, instead of, switching you're having the insurance company say you have to go to a dry power inhaler just go try to go straight to an ICS LABA instead uh, or does the insurance company mandate that you have to have that step before you know the, the dry powder before you can do a Simbacort or a Dulera or an Advair no I mean yeah you could do that too it's just yeah more of a stepwise procedure but I find that most commercial have now been doing, um, unfortunately, Advair is first thing rather than, which also has a dry powder, or, you know, has a um, a discus. So you have to be careful what you're ordering for that one too. Um, so it's just a matter of when you're ordering, looking at the wording when you're ordering. So be very, very thoughtful because many of the same brand will have different types of, um, like Advair comes in a discus as well as an HFA. Asthma Next comes in a, HFA as well as a twist tailor. So just being very, very thoughtful about when you're ordering. Good information. That's a good idea. If they don't do that, go to some record. Or...
Any other things to share around prescribing? We can always go back to these topics. Um, education and workflow. So uh, with starting a program comes education of your staff, of yourself, of us. We've been learning through this process too. And then workflow, how do you do the thing? So um, again, these were identified uh, wins from you. Uh, Pre-visit identification of patients with asthma. Um, additional staff education, including the asthma clinic for patients and staff. If we can hear more about that, that would be awesome. Uh, revised asthma template and adding in order sets. Um, again, that kind of went back to the tech piece. Uh, reminder to grab um, the asthma action plan, the ACT or other resources that you'll need uh, in the room for the visit. And then uh, somebody implemented physical reminders into the workflow to utilize dot phrases. So um, you can kind of see the, the, the trend here of uh, incorporating the workflow, but then um, also setting up reminders to do uh, that new piece of the workflow and then educating staff and yourself on starting that. Best practices to share, um, new innovative things that have uh, come out of the program around education and workflow. So this is Dr. Asme. Um, we did have, uh, we did do a couple of uh, what we call them asthma clinic. Uh, I dedicated a couple of afternoons where we did invite a respiratory therapist that came from uh, uh, the PFK program from uh, Dayton children. And uh, so she came to my office. We identified patients with asthma that they have been to the emergency room. Uh, we called them and uh, just like we set up a time a little bit later in the day. Usually I schedule patients until like 4.30, but we did the clinic from like 4 to 6. So we made sure we can get those patients um, after school. And uh, so we had a couple of clinics where we got the patient that were like the most problematic that they have been to the ER. And uh, so the, the respiratory therapist, they, she came a little bit earlier, uh, talked to my staff about, you know, education, the patient, how to uh, use the um, spacer, um, the, demonstrated the technique to my staff. She did also go and teach the patient. So they did see her teaching and uh, she did so teach the staff and the patient and uh, then watched my staff doing the teaching and, uh, you know, kind of try to see like run the, you know, do like the good flow of how we're going to incorporate the asthma control test, the action, uh, asthma action plan. So, I mean, it was really good to um, dedicate, you know, just a couple of hours in a couple of days to, uh, you know, drill in how we're going to do the uh, flow for the asthma patient so we don't miss anything. And uh, that that did work really great for my uh, patient and my staff. And patient liked it because they felt it was like really a time dedicated to talk about asthma. And uh, so instead of like coming for a sick visit and we talk about asthma or during their checkup, we call them, we say we need, you know, to do that. And we're having an asthma clinic day and the respiratory therapist. So we made it like a big deal. And uh, so that, that I think patient liked it and, and it was good for us to, I mean, we may try to do that again in the future, maybe once a month like that, but at least it was to help us drill kind of what we need to do for the asthma patient. Um, uh, get it a little bit more intensive training. That sounds amazing. That's what a great idea. Yeah, that's really great. Especially with the respiratory therapist piece, that's like a wonderful like utilization of resources and education. Yeah, and then she did uh, bring some uh, kind of um, uh, asthma, uh, I mean, spacers and stuff. So she was able to get us some samples. So for patient who needed an extra one for a different household or whatever. So it, it was really good. And they brought a lot of uh, educational material and they helped us to put it in the, uh, organize it in the office in certain, like those accordion kind of uh, containers so we can grab whatever education we need for the inhalers and uh, the asthma control. And we even would work on the asthma action plan. So she did pre-fill certain things for, let's say, if we're going to do the Symbicort, 
Uh, she did pre-fill certain asthma action plan, so to make it easier for us. And then we have some that are still uh, completely empty. Uh, so we do have like, you know, whatever. we're trying few things to make it like easy because in the middle of like working day, I'm seeing a patient for something and suddenly it's an asthma and, you know, I don't have time and my staff to do all that. So we were trying trying to kind of solve all these problems with those asthma, uh, you know, clinic, uh, you know, trials time. Thank you, Dr. Asme. Um, I'm getting just as excited hearing it again as I did the first time. Thank you for sharing. That is um, above and beyond. Thank you. And Dr. Asme, you said that PFK um, helps set that up with the respiratory therapist. Um, I don't know how who other groups are on with partners. I'm with partners for kids in the nationwide Dayton area. Um, is that something they're advertising to practices or? I did, you know, I asked them for that. So it was something I was, you know, asking to do. And they, they uh, this respiratory therapist, she volunteered, but um, I got her one of the last clinic was just the day before she yeah. left her position to go somewhere. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think, yeah. <laughs> Hi, That's, this is Susan uh, Mills. Um, yeah. Dr. Asme, I was the one who came out and uh, did all the work for you. Yes. I am super happy to help any other practices. I'm with uh, Pediatric Associates right now, but um, if anybody has any questions or anything I can do, I'm happy to help, you know, kind of work with that um, flow and structure of practices. Just wanted to put that out there. Yeah, it was wonderful, Susan. Thank you very much. It was really, really helpful. Susan, we should recruit you for our next uh, learning discussion here. <laughs> Always thinking into the future with this program. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, Dr. Reese said you muted, so. <laughs> oh, yeah. Susan, um, anything um, to share? Um, the clinic is a good example. What what else can be can be done or has been done? So I think the biggest thing with um, trying to have an effective asthma program is to have everything, you know, within arm's reach. So some of the things we've done over here is, um, you know, all the asthma action plans, the asthma control test, um, asthma materials are in each patient room. So the physician, all they have to do is uh, pull those materials out. So it's not a lot of, you know, spending an extra, you know, time going here, going there for it. Um, and then we've kind of built into, um, just like with Dr. Asme, just kind of building into the whole flow from the moment they check in to, you know, educating staff, identifying uh, asthma patients, um, and then kind of doing follow-ups if they're seen in the emergency room or urgent care, hospitalized, um, to kind of give them priority to get back in um, to see them. Very helpful. Okay. Again, we can always revisit. Um, resources. Again, things kind of uh, work in tandem and kind of all work at the same time. Uh, but you have so far uh, implemented self-management materials and other asthma resources, keeping them at hand, uh, easy to grab. Um, I, If someone would like to share uh, what they have received from ODH and the asthma resources, um, the, the request link uh, from the website. I know there was a little bit of delay in getting stuff, but for those of you who got boxes of stuff, um, if you could maybe share. Um, increased use of uh, written resources, which is a good thing. A, a little tip is keeping hard copies of the asthma action plan outside or inside of the exam rooms. And then from somebody, uh, keeping all their handouts in the rooms uh, makes it likely for um, someone to remember and give it to the patients as they are talking to the family. So that there's, again, with the theme of reminders and keeping things handy and um, learning the actual thing and what it says and becoming more comfortable talking about it, I think all kind of goes hand in hand. But um, anyone want to comment on the ODH resources that they have received so far? So we've um, really enjoyed the ODH resources, especially the um, the spacers. Um, the books have been fabulous. Those go so fast. Um, so we just need more. 
<laughs> Did they lead you to believe there was a limit? There is. Yeah. Yeah. There's a limit of the spacers. Um, so we got, um, I believe it was five spacers. Um, and um, so, I mean, it, every little bit helps, right? So, um, but the books have been so great for the younger kids. And then we also show the, um, the uh, NCH, DCH, PFK uh, asthma video that got launched um, in the asthma clinic as well. And that's been, it's animated, um, uh, just kind of what is asthma and that's been really well received as well. Susan, is that available on the PFK resources website that we have linked? I believe it is. Um, it's a YouTube, it's on YouTube. Um, I can send it to you just in case. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. This is Dr. Asma. I just want to add also something that can help with the patient for the asthma action plan. So instead of just telling them to, uh, you know, Go to the uh, my chart. I think they can just take a photocopy of. I mean, just take a picture of the asthma action plan on their phone. Um, I mean, so that everybody I have, you know, the patient, the parent, they can take the just you know a photo on their phone. Uh, I mean, a lot of educational material. I try to tell the patient rather than giving them paper, just tell them to take a just a picture on their iPhone because this is they're gonna. Have have it with them everywhere. So they don't even have to go to access, you know, their chart. They can just have it on their phone. Also a good idea of embracing tech. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> um, I am uh, watching the clock, but if anyone has any challenges and solutions uh, to share, uh, this is kind of a broad topic, um, but we, we talk about wins and, and we prefer those, but um, were you able to work through a challenge that you uh, faced with a patient with asthma or maybe their caregiver or family? Um, real examples? I can share something. This is Susan Mills again. Um, so one of the patients that actually it's happened with several patients, but sometimes when primary care providers refer them out to a specialist um, and they take over their asthma care, um, the primary care provider doesn't always know um, what changes are being made. Sometimes we get reports and sometimes we just kind of get the face sheet that says that they saw them and there's nothing on there. And so there's been times where we thought they were on one medication and, and the allergist had them on a different medication and then pulmonary had them on yet a different medication. And I think it's come with all this shifting of Flovent no longer, the brand not no longer being available with commercial pay. So just trying to kind of be real cautious with that in trying to update our charts um, anytime they are seeing a specialist. So that's one of the things that I, I verify um, is to make sure and ask those questions. When is the last time you saw the allergist or pulmonologist? So we can make sure our, our medical records line up with them. I know in Epic, it's a perfect world, but in other, <laughs> in other systems, it's, it's a little more work. Our care team communications with primary care and specialists, no matter what type of specialist, is that uh, kind of teamwork and, and communication uh, a gap that's usually identified? I'm sorry, I missed part of that question. Um, care team communication, um, no matter the type of specialist, is that kind of always something that um, needs to be improved? Yeah, it definitely does, especially if they're more complex and are seeing, you know, multiple um, specialists. I think mm -hmm. that, especially in our end, um, as far as like working out how to make sure that we're getting the full reports and and then our records are being updated once we get those. I think that's good to hear for us, you know, um, just have to really make sure we get good letters to you guys. I, um, 
um, you know, for us, we do Epic and supposedly it sends a letter out to the referring physician, but I honestly never really know what, uh, what, what goes out there. But anyway, I, yes. I'm, I'm glad to so hear for that. us. We only get the face sheet that says that they saw what specialist on what day. And if you want um, the detailed documents, then you have to reach out. Well, that creates a whole nother job for somebody else um, to go into, you know, the EPIC system and get access, then print off the report, then get it to the physician. And so it's definitely much easier if we are getting that full report. Good call out. Someday, someday it'll all it'll all work. Amen. <laughs> if we can all just be on Epic. <laughs> or something else. So to uh, end on high notes, um, let's talk through some patient wins that have been shared. Um, so better flow for um, asthma patients, um, visit flow. Uh, maybe a lung flow as well, which is a good thing. Um, improvement in optimal asthma care since the program started. Good to hear that. Zero hospitalizations due to asthma since the program started. The uh, vast majority of patients are ad adequately controlled. Again, we are seeing uh, this reflected in the data. Um, access to asthma action plan within your system that allows families to access at any time. Uh, you could also take a picture that we, we learned today. Um, yeah, we're, we're, we're tossing around QR codes and all of that. So um, stay tuned for kind of the advances there. Um, helpful handouts for patients, more clear and easier to complete asthma action plans. Um, I have heard that the Ohio AAP branded one is uh, simple and easy to um, explain and easy to digest for the patients and families. And that's a good thing, but use the one that you are most comfortable with. And then um, identified helpful resources that and have made them available for patients. So all of that is a good thing. And then um, the, the wins kind of broke themselves out into program and patient. So program wins include staff involvement after education and training. I think that you can get your staff um, excited about learning more about this and helping the patients. I think that's been happening. Um, interest in improving optimal asthma care for providers and residents. Awareness of the importance of updating and reviewing um, asthma action plans. Identification of various environmental triggers. Um, maybe this wasn't being talked about before the program started and now it is, and that's a good thing. <laughs> Excuse me. Identified barriers to scoring and documenting ACT results. Uh, we talked a little bit about that in one of the previous calls, um, uh, getting comfortable with it or maybe using a shorter version or um, having some training around ACT. Awareness of the patients with asthma and utilizing teamwork in their care. Um, I think that is kind of full circle to the point that we were just talking about. Teamwork doesn't just mean um, your practice staff. It means maybe the care team for the patient as a whole. And then identifying the need for increased education handouts uh, to asthma patients. Uh, improving, uh, establishing accurate reports within uh, your system. And then creating order sets. Uh, asthma dot phrases also a win, and then templates as reminders to ask all appropriate questions and give handouts. So I think we've been kind of leaning into what we can do around asthma, and so have you, and we appreciate, again, your, your hard work with this. Uh, we have one more minute. So next steps, um, please submit your monthly patient totals for each month. Um, Dana uses those to uh, calculate some of her data. And then we are in March, uh, doing March data. So that will be due um, Tuesday, April 2nd. And I will um, uh, echo uh, Zainab for your appreciation for getting your uh, data in um, in a timely manner when you do. Appreciate that very much. It makes everything easier. And then the next um, asthma action period call number six is uh, Monday, April 8th. So that is a big day. That is Eclipse Day. Uh, we are all aware that it is Eclipse Day. We're going to lean into Eclipse Day and hold the meeting. Uh, it will end before totality outside. So we are going to still have the meeting on April 8th. We will record it just like normal. If you um, are out of town, uh, we appreciate that. But we'll be hearing from Dr. Wells on uh, DEI issues around asthma. So that would be a really good um, call to um, attend if you can or watch later. And then stay tuned for uh, the asthma training series. Um, I will be sending out more information on that. That will be pushed to our whole membership. Um, it is attached to, but not a requirement of this program. So we would love to have you attend and learn more, but it is uh, a standalone from this program. It just happens to be um, around the same topics of asthma.
And then look forward to uh, getting from me um, the talking points and the rat cards that are almost finalized and almost to print. So we'll keep you posted on all of that. Um, lastly, any questions? I'm a minute over. Okay, I'm an email away. Thank you all for joining today. Thank you for your help and good conversation. Um, I will talk to you all soon. Thanks so much. Thank you, bye.